the uh, pictures of Peru. I understand they had a wonderful trip and uh, God did a lot of good things. I'll be praying for the next trip that's coming up, which is, let's see, this is October. I think there might be a trip coming up in the winter months. I can't remember if it's Mexico or not, um, but I'm going to Ethiopia, Lord willing, at the end of February. So be praying because uh, they're, they're really having a difficult time there in Ethiopia. Uh, it's just really, really a challenge. It used to be, I mean, it's not this way now, but it used to be they were averaging three or four pastors a week being killed. That was back in the communist days. And the country has taken a major turn and allowed for safety and allowed for uh, variances of opinions when it comes to religion. And so now there can be believers uh, there and there is a great number of people that are turning to faith. I mean, it's kind of hard when you come into a country that um, is pri pri predominantly Muslim and they basically say, um, you, you're going to be Muslim and you say no. And they said, how would you like to send your kids to college? Well, we don't have the money. How would you like to send them free? Yeah, we'd like that. Well, convert to being a Muslim and we'll send your kids to college. And that's kind of what they do. All that money from all the oil companies and all the, uh, you know, Islamic regions, Saudi Arabia and all those areas, heavy, heavy influence. Okay, Matthew chapter 24. Let me open up in prayer and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it alone. We thank you that we can have saving faith in Christ that changes our life. Father, I pray that you would um, open our eyes to see wonderful things from your word. Open our eyes to behold the truth of your word. And may this, Father, be our testament that we love you, that we obey you, and that we follow you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so you've got Matthew chapter 24 on a regular sized piece of paper. Structure is the key word that I want you to think about. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a, a bracket. You know what a bracket looks like, right? Pastor, will you push that back a little bit? Well, maybe I don't want you to see it. I know, but it's not on you. No, but I don't want, because it was hanging over the Oh, you think it will fall on me? Yeah. And kill me? Yeah. He was a good man, but he died by a blackboard that killed him. <laughs> so when you when you bracket something, you, you do this, right? Yeah. Okay, so... This structure, I think, will help you. Beginning with verse 1, put a bracket there, all right, and go all the way down the side of the page. It's a long bracket, all the way to verse 28, which is on the back. Okay? Verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. Verse 1 to verse 28. Now, this is called the birth pains. That's what it's called, the birth pains. When Jesus Christ is talking about the coming of the end, he uses an illustration. It's like a woman who's going to give birth. Okay? So do you see that? One big bracket. All right. Now, there is a second bracket within that bracket that begins in verse 15. We're going to call this severe birth pains. So there's the birth pains that are taking place, which are just common. And then there's one particularly sharp birth pain. And that goes from 15 to 21. Okay? So put a bracket there. I should have, well, I should have taken verse 22 and put an indentation for you there, but I didn't. 15 through 21? 15 through 21, severe, yeah. Severe right. Pain, right. Severe. severe, yeah. Or you could, yeah. You could put bad. Sharp. You could use sharp, severe. Okay. So here's what's going on. In the first part here, 15 or 1 to 28, in this big period of time, Jesus is going to be telling us and giving to us signs, general signs of what the coming the second coming of the Lord is going to be. 
Remember they asked questions in verse 3. They're on the Mount of Olives. They came to him privately saying, what will these things be? Verse 3, tell us what the sign of your coming is. Right? And then Jesus begins in verse 4. What does he begin? He begins telling them what's going to transpire and what's going to take place. See that no one misleads you. Verse 5, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Circle that word Christ because the word Christ actually means anointed one. All right? Or the Lord's anointed. Now, why do I say that? Because you can translate it, I am the anointed one or I am the Christ. We don't see a lot of people walking around today saying, I'm Jesus. But we do see a lot of people walking around saying, I'm the Lord's anointed. Listen to me. Listen to what I teach. The doctrine that I'm going to give you is the correct doctrine, which turns out to be, as Jesus is going to say, false doctrine. Verse 6, you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this all must take place. Underline this, comma, but the end is not yet. So the, that's the birth pains, which are the just before the delivery, and these are happening right now today. So I want you to know that what Jesus is saying is get ready. End times are coming. Here's what you're looking for. Are you with me? Yeah. Following what I'm saying? But the end is not yet. Why does he say that? Well, because there's more signs yet to come that are going to give us a clearer and a more directed understanding. Notice what he says. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes in various places. These are all but what? The beginning of birth pains. Do you see that? Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that it's just the beginning. It's not the end. It's the beginning. So understand, when Jesus is talking about and people say, what's going to be like in the end? Jesus is saying, during, I'm going to use a word here that you may have not heard before, inter-advental. Have you ever heard that word, inter-advental? No. You're probably wondering what that means. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you have the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and his birth, his crucifixion, and then his resurrection. Okay, this is his first coming. Between this time and the second coming of Christ, that's what we call the inter-advental period. Meaning inter, I-N-T-E-R, and then advent, A-L. So between this period of time to this period of time, all this is going to happen. All right? Just a general characteristic. But he also is going to let us know, Paul's going to say in 2 Thessalonians, about an antichrist who has to be revealed, right? A destruction of the temple or the holy place. One that is in there pretending to be God, offering itself as God. So there's a lot of signs that have to take place. These are just general signs that we see even right now today, don't we? These are general signs that we say. And he lets us know from the resurrection to the second coming of Christ, this is what's going to take place. In the natural realm, there's going to be international rivalry. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famine and flood. In the natural realm, in the spiritual realm, there's going to be apostasy. There's going to be a succession of waves of apostasy, literally. There's going to be self-promotion by many people who claim to be Christ claiming to usurp the power of the Lord even himself. And this whole time is called the birth pains of the Messiah. That's what this bracket here. Now, this bracket, which is within this context, we're going to call the sharp birth pains. So I'm giving you structure on how to, how to break this passage down. Now, beginning in verse 15, it's a period literally of the destruction of Jerusalem. That's what it is. Beginning in verse 15 down to verse 21. 
Notice what it says. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Who's the reader? Well, what Matthew hasn't been written yet when Jesus has given this. So he's talking to those who've read the book of Daniel. Those who have read the book of Daniel understand let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let one on the rooftop not come down to the house. Let one in the field not turn back, take his cloak. This here from verse 15 down to 21 is what happened in 70 AD. That was the destruction of Jerusalem. Terrible, terrible time. So in every period of time when there's been persecution and suffering, there have been some people escaped. I mean, stop and think about the Nazi death camps, Auschwitz. Millions of people killed, but several thousand were spared. Dachau, work camp, many, many killed, several thousand spared. But when it came to this period of time in Jerusalem, when the Romans sieged it, beginning in about, the signs of it were pretty clear in 66 AD, and then definitely in 68 AD, Many of the Christians during this time fled to the hills. And then by the time 70 AD had come, it had totally been wiped out and destroyed. And no one escaped. No one escaped. They put a siege on the city. If you remember, we talked about that. They literally ate their own kids. They did everything they can because they were literally starving for food. And this was a terrible, terrible period of time. So... If you understand the structure of Matthew 24, you begin to understand how to interpret it. Okay? Questions? Uh, where in Acts is that? Where in Acts? Is it in Acts, the, the uh, 60 AD to 68? Well, second? You, you have in the book of Acts the church meeting in Jerusalem, then what do you have shortly thereafter? <coughs> People scattering everywhere. Okay. And they go throughout the entire region because okay, so of the persecution. Like the in, in the book of Acts? Yeah. I don't remember off the top of my head. That's a good question. We can look that up uh, to see if, it, if it's mentioned specifically in the book of Acts. It's a good question because the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostle, yes. I'm going to ask you a real dumb question. I get confused all the time. Okay. What is a? I know what before Christ, but what does A D represent for initial? What is Ad, Adam Dominion, which means yeah, yeah. So we just say after death. Now they don't date that way anymore. They use C B. Uh, they use B C. What do they do? They, C B E. C E current. Before current error. C E well, is current. C -E. That's that's C E is current error. I know, but if you go to a college or you go to a university and you put AD or BC, you'll get dinged on your paper. They require you to put CE, and then I think the other one is BCE, which is before common error. Somebody Google that. You should be able to find that on Google. Oh, what did it say? It just said CE. I didn't get a definition. Oh, somebody asked, hey, Suri. What does CE stand for? It says common for error. Common, common error. error. Yeah, right. And so what does BCE stand for? Before common error. Before common error. Yeah. You know some, some Jewish websites use CE also. No, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, I, I don't think it's a big... I, here we got a controversy over... it. I don't think it's a big deal. I mean, it, it, I, I know um, that for us, we date our calendar different and... You know, there's different ways of looking at the dating period. In fact, even in the flood of Noah, when you, it says that Noah was in the boat and you begin to calculate the days, depending upon what calendar you use, it was either a full year, 365 days, or 365 plus 11 days, depending upon how you calculate. Because we, we haven't always used the Julian calendar. We haven't always used that because we, the problem is, is that how we've divvied up the years and the months if you keep to it long enough, you actually get out of sync. That's why we have a leap year. And so you'll actually have winter time not being in the winter, 
or that we're used to, the months of November, or I should say December, January, and February, won't show that. It'll actually, if you do it long enough, will actually be the hot months <laughs> because we haven't changed that, right? So we, that's why we have a leap year every four years to make up the time. I, I don't think that that's, there's anything wrong about it. it it's like, now I'm gonna really get myself in trouble. Um, do you remember the Christmas cards that say Merry Xmas? Yeah, I don't like it. I don't like it, but do you know why it was that? Well, that's probably true in some cases, but also the Greek word for Christ begins with chi, the letter chi, and so um, it's the abbreviation of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I understand that, but I don't think the world understands that when you send this out. I don't think so, right? So don't send, don't send me a Merry Xmas card. I'll be really angry. Okay, yeah. Well, if there's money in it. If, if there's money in it, I'll send it back. <laughs> yeah, so getting back to that, the question asked. Uh, yeah. Luke didn't offer Adam uh, before the fall of the temple. And said he yeah, because that would have been in, what, 40 to 50? What was what was the actual date of the author? Uh, it was, well, it has to be before 70 AD because right. there is no description of... So do, who has a study Bible? Look up... Look up at the beginning of your study Bible. I saw somebody with a really big, thick study Bible around here. Who's got a study Bible? Anybody got a study Bible? Yes. Karen, you got you got does she read it at all, or does she just... <laughs> she's got. She just got it. Well, I hate to get popped in the head with that. It, doesn't, it, doesn't it say like 55 to 65 AD? We're looking for Acts. Acts, yeah. The book of Acts, what year? Yeah, before... It has to be before 70. I didn't bring my study Bible with me. I've got it upstairs. Between 53 and 70 AD. Okay. That's what your study Bible says? Yes. Okay. So, 63, 70 AD. So, if it was written before that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't mention it. But it does mention the 12 tribes that are dispersed. So this is just right before that time where there's great suffering and persecution. And you can read about that. Um, you know, have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Josephus? Mm -hmm. Okay, he's a secular historian of the time. And he writes in what he calls the Jewish Wars. And he explains it really, really clearly. And it's amazing. You can get... You, so we believe in the historical reality of Jesus in terms of he was a real person. He walked on the face of the earth. You can actually reference the life of Christ in secular literature as well. You can look it up and clearly Jesus existed. So if somebody tries to tell you he didn't exist, baloney. Okay? So do you understand the structure so far? Okay. So now I want us to look at the words that we use to describe the coming of Christ, all right? And I'm going to make a list of them here. And I, this is what I want to show you. I'm going to take you in several places in the Bible and show you that there are three words that are commonly used to refer to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? The revelation of our Lord. Now, depending upon which view you hold, you have one view here. You have the death of our Lord. You have the resurrection, you have the life of Christ, and then a second coming over here, right? Some people believe in just one coming here of our Lord where he returns. Some people believe that there is a secret rapture that takes place here. And then you have this seven-year period here called the tribulation, all right? Most of you have probably been taught this view. This is the view that I grew up with. This is the view that I've come to now um, believe. And again, I don't want to fight about it. We're not here to argue about it. We're not here to cause wars about it. We're only talking about seven years. It is pretty profound to think, though, 
I mean, if we're taken out of here, then this great tribulational period here, Christians won't experience that. You'll be taken up into heaven if that's the view that you hold to. If you hold to this view that is not going to come till after that tribulation period, and I want to simply say this, that in every tribulation period or every difficult time in the world where it's been hard, even hard for believers, God has always spared his people and protected them. So, so even if you go through this period of time, you're still going to be protected and cared for and loved by God. We just looked at that this morning. A man by the name Noah built an ark. God was, what was he doing? He was destroying the earth. Why? Because of the wicked sinfulness of man. And what did he do to Noah? And what did he do for his family? Spared him. So in one sense, we can see that God does spare. All right. So here's the first word I want you to write down. It's the word parousia. I'll spell it for you. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A. Parousia. Greek word. And while you're looking at that, I want you to turn and write this down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You're going to see this word parousia used. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. Okay? The, the title of, of this section in my Bible is called The Coming of the Lord. So verse 15, This we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that those who are alive, who are left until the coming of that is the parousia of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. What is he talking about there? The dead. The dead. Yeah, it's a euphemism for the dead. So, we who are alive and left to the coming of the Lord, we are not going to proceed, but we're not going to, what? We're not going to precede those who have fallen asleep, meaning this. We're not going to go to glory before them. Why? They've died. Where are they? In the presence of They're in the presence of the Lord. Right? Now, hang on. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. And listen to this language. You descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel... And with the sound of the trumpet of God. Does that sound like something that's secret to you? No. <laughs> Sounds like it's pretty loud, pretty visible, right? Notice this. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Someone has said the trumpet's loud enough to wake the dead. <laughs> Verse 17 then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. <clears throat> and thus we will always be with the Lord. Now, if you believe in a secret rapture, then that passage of scripture for you refers to this time right here. So if you are a pre-tribulationalist, meaning we're going to leave, he excuse me, we're going to leave the earth before the tribulation, that's... 1 Thessalonians, they say that's the rapture. I think more clearly, because it uses the word parousia, the coming of our Lord, which you're going to see as it's mentioned, he's going to use three words to refer to his coming. One is parousia, and it not only means that in Thessalonians in the first chapter, but it also means it in 2 Thessalonians. So turn over to 2 Thessalonians with me, verse 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Do you follow what I'm saying? Steve. Well, I, I think that these uh, things that are described in Scripture are for everyone's going to hear it. And, that, and that's because I would say that 1 Thessalonian passage is not referring to a secret rapture, but I think it's referring to the second coming I, because I don't see that there's a difference. So, But if you are one who doesn't believe 
or, or believes in a rapture prior to the tribulation, I guess you would have to say that would be a, a, a trumpet that only believers hear. It says comfort one another with these words. Yeah. Right. So we're being comforted by it. Right. Right. But the, what you know? What's that? What's that comfort mean? That comfort means it's the re, it's the return of the Lord. He's coming. He's coming. That's that's what he's saying. He's announcing the coming of the Lord. Why do you, Why do you say only believers get here? Well, I, okay. If it's a loud trumpet, then everybody's going to hear it, right? So. Everything that I've been taught about the rapture is that it's a secret rapture where we're just going about our daily business and the Lord comes to grab us away and pew, we just sky out of here. So I, have you read the Left Behind series? Yeah, or, yeah. You know, so if a, a, a pilot is piloting a plane and he's a Christian and pew, he's just taken out of there. Plane goes down and, you know, because all the believers yeah. are gone. That would be if you hold to this view here. And again, I'm, I'm trying to, in fairness, speak to both views. Even though I hold to this view, you'll not be criticized, made fun of, or laughed at in any way if you hold to this view. Okay, we're not going to argue or split a church over it. It's ridiculous. We're talking about a seven-year period. I think it's all talking about, what I'm going to say is all the references to the coming, all the reference to the parousia, same word, all the references to the epiphania, which is the manifestation or the appearance, all the references to the apocalypse, which is the revelation, all use similar language, identical language that refers to this period here. Okay? But you have to, you have to decide that. You have to look at the verses and decide, does that fit? Okay? started to talk about the tribulation. Yes. Then you kind of made a left turn and you started talking about this. Right. Now tie those two together. Where's the tribulation? The tribulation period? is right here in this period of time between the okay, the tribulation period if you are a person who believes in just one second coming, the tribulation period of time precedes before the Lord's coming. If you are someone who believes in a rapture before that you believe that it's a seven year period of time that we're taken away before. So we're going to get tribulation. That's pretty clear. And we're going to get it, and it's going to increase in magnitude. It's going to start here, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse until the Lord returns. Now, if you believe in a, in a, in a pre tribulational rapture, that's why it's called pre tribulational, it means that here, when the tribulation begins, we don't know when. But they would say that it begins at the rapture of the church. When the church is taken out of the way, then the tribulation begins. When does the 70th week of Daniel start? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that because I think that's one of the most misunderstood passages of Scripture. It's a great question. What do you do with Daniel's 70 weeks? Because a lot of people put Daniel's 70 weeks here, right, the 70th week in the future, and we've got to ask ourselves the question, is the Daniel 70th week really in the future? So Daniel's going to speak about weeks. He's going to speak about a period of time of seven seventies. And the 70th week, he's going to go like from week 1 to 69. It's going to describe a seven-year period, uh, period of time, but then he's going to speak about a 70th week. Now, I'm not going to get into that right now, but I will, okay? Because I, I just don't want to throw everything on you at once and it becomes confusing. So hold that hold that in your mind. Can I ask you one more question? No. I, I don't <laughs> did, Scott, did Scott say that out loud? Did, I'm pretty sure he said that out loud. <coughs> so if we believe like you believe without the... the yeah, the, you mean the right view? Yeah. <laughs> the correct view. So the tribulation... Will we know the tribulation is there? Yeah, 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 yeah. How are we going to know that? Well, just Jesus just described what all the birth pains are going to be. Okay. And now, now, now go to Second Thessalonians. Okay, I've got it. Okay, go to Second Thessalonians chapter two. Okay, okay. and and remember we covered this. Let no one deceive you. Verse three. Okay. Remember they're asking the question here in chapter two that the, they thought the day of the Lord had already happened, okay. right? Yeah. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and us being gathered together to him. 
We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter, that the defective day of the Lord has already come. They were freaking out. They were like, it's already come. We missed it. We missed it. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless... And then he begins to list a whole bunch of things that have to happen. What has to happen? A rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness will be revealed. That's the Antichrist. The son of destruction who opposes himself against every so-called God or object of worship. Now this also reads in terms of future of what happened in 70 AD. Okay? So this is kind of a map that overlays the map. Who opposes and exalts himself against God. Do you not remember? Verse 5, when I was with you, I told you these things. That you know what's restraining him now. So that he may be revealed in his time. But what's restraining him right now? God. Ultimately, the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. But... The answer is found in the very next verse. What is restraining him now will be revealed in his time for the mystery of what? Is already at work. I mean, why is our country continuing to go the direction it is? Lawlessness. Absolute lawlessness. I talked to our, uh, uh, not, not Dan Dow this morning, but I was talking to Delaney who is is it an assistant DA? Is that the title that he holds? Assistant DA? He says, so the way that it works is shoplifting. The reason why it's so bad is anything under $950 is considered a misdemeanor. Right? So they, when you put in a law that says that's no different than a taillight that's burned out in your car, and they're not really prosecuting or putting people in jail for that kind of stuff, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to they're gonna do it, right? But what, 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 what's going to happen if you continue to defund the police? We're already seeing it. Murder up 40%. Why is that? Defunded the police. There, there's a direct corollary between the restraining action of law and lawlessness. And what was going on in Noah's day is there was no law. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes, it says in the book of Judges. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do now until he's taken out of the way. Now, if you hold to this view here, in a pre-tribulational rapture, they believe that that is a reference. Some of them do, not all of them. Um, that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And so they say, when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, meaning the church, all hell's going to break loose. And, and I would say... You know, you got people getting saved during the tribulation. Uh, how's that going to happen without the Holy Spirit? Amen. So, but again, I, I want to be fair. That's that's how they understand it. If I'm if I'm reading them correctly, as a pre-tribber, yes, it, I believe it's the Holy Spirit through the church. The church is released, but the Holy Spirit can never leave. Okay, so you would say then the restrainer would be the church. The Holy Spirit through the church. The Holy yes. Spirit through the church. Okay, so they would say the Holy Spirit through the church, and then. Um, so they would say that's the restrainer, okay? And, and that certainly is a restraint. Is not the church a restraint? Aren't we called to be salt and light in a world of darkness? So there's an element to that. All right, now hang on. Look at this, because this is where it gets really interesting. Verse uh, 8, the lawless one will be revealed when the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his what? Parousia. Now this verse is a key verse. Because this verse uses all three terms for the coming of the Lord. The lawless one will be revealed. Right? Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing the appearance of of his coming, the manifestation of his coming. Same exact word. Same exact word is used in 1 Thessalonians. Not a difference. So, what I'm saying, and what I think scripture is teaching, 
is that that is a reference to the second coming of Christ. Go to another one. Go to 1 Thessalonians. Just back up again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. No, chapter 1. I'm, no, chapter 3. Make up, your mind. Make up my mind. Come Verse on. 13. So that he may establish in your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at what? The coming. So in the context, he is directing us and he wants us to abound with love for one another more and more in verse 12. That your heart might be established, that you might be blameless in holiness before God, our Father, at what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that word parousia here. So, at least in those passages where the word parousia means, it means the coming of our Lord. And it all refers to this period of time. That's what I believe that it's teaching. Now hang on, because I'm going to give you a, another word for it, okay? Apocalypse. What's the name of the book of Revelation? You remember? Revelation is the apocalypse. That's the Greek word, right? It means revelation, the apocalypse, right? That's the word that we use. So... Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. So right now I'm just giving you words that are used to describe the coming of Christ. First one is parousia, which is the coming. Second one is apocalypse. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7. Well, let me back up to, I'll just go to verse 4. Give thanks to my God always because of the grace of God that is given you in Jesus Christ that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and in all knowledge even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you now here it is verse 7 so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you await for the apocalypse of our Lord Jesus Christ Christ, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you probably want to circle that one. Now go back to 2 Thessalonians. Let me show you again. 2 Thessalonians, this time let's go to chapter 1. You're going to see the same Greek word used again. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'll back up to verse 5. This is the evidence of righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to those of you who are affected as well. So you have affliction and you have relief that are governing this passage of scripture. And this is going to take place when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed, apocalypse, from heaven with his mighty angels. That is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. Are you following with me? Now look at Remember I gave you a structure on this piece of paper right here and you put the brackets? All right, turn over to the back side, verse 29. So what do you have mentioned here? You have the revelation, you have angels, right? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, which I think is a reference. And, and by the way, um, if you're a pre-tribulational you believe in verse 29 through 31 as referring to the second coming. You don't believe, do you believe that that is a rapture or do you believe that's a second coming? Because um, I've, I've read both. Yeah. Um, okay. I believe that Revelation follows in progressive order. Uh huh. Each of each, each seven. Each of the seals. Seals. Mm -hmm. um, right. That's progresses true. to the next one. Right. So there's. And when you look in Ezekiel, there's a quarter of the people are going to be killed. Okay. Then 
But in, Matt, in, in Matthew all 24, in what do you think that's this all is? That's the beginning. I, part of it could be part of the Ezekiel War, but I believe it's all before most, a lot of this because when the ho first horseman comes out, you know, he comes out and then he's but, got to establish his... But, but on the structure of Matthew 24, do you believe that the, that's the second coming in verse 29 or a rapture? Is it this or is it this? Well, not sure? Okay, not look sure. at the language. Immediately after the tribulation of those mm -hmm. days, right? So if it's the second coming, immediately after the tribulation of those days, what days? These days right here, the days that preceded. Mm -hmm. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken. Typical prophetic, catastrophic language. Then will appear in the sign of heaven the Son of Man. Here he is coming. All the tribes in the earth are going to look at him. They're going to mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with glory and power. And watch this. What is he going to do? Send out his angels with a what? A loud trumpet. See, that's why I say 1 Thessalonians is not about a secret rapture. It's a loud trumpet. And they will gather his elect from the four winds of heaven. He'll gather all of his believers together. Apocalypse is the same word that is used. Revelation and parousia is the same word for coming. And here in this particular passage in 2 Corinthians or 2 Thessalonians 1 through 7, the idea of him recompensing or the idea of him paying out. What is due to those who have done wrong are those who are afflicted and those who will enter into their rest. So if the rapture already took place, they would have already entered into their rest. Their affliction would have already stopped. Let me give you one more. And then we'll have to... What time is it? Because I can't never tell. 1041. 1041? Okay. Ha have I lost you guys? No. Are, are you like, oh, what is it? Oh, my gosh. So 29, that's the second coming. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, well, I, I, personally, I believe all the references are to a second coming. Some people in Christianity believe in a secret coming of the Lord, a rapture that will take place before the second coming. But I think the rapture and the second coming are the same thing. And then, and, and also fairness, there are people who hold to a mid-tribulational period who believes that the tribulation starts here, but the Lord doesn't actually come till halfway in between. And you're post-trib? Yeah, I'm post-trib, uh, post-trib slash pre-wrath. So I believe that just before the final outpouring of his wrath... I'm going into the bus tax. So... Well, if you want to, if you if, if, if you want if you want to pick if you want to pick the best one, I mean, pre-trib getting out of here before anything bad happens sounds pretty good to me, right? I mean, who wouldn't want that? But you know, here's the thing: it's going to be really bad, and we say, well, you know, we're over here in America, where it ain't so bad. Yes. Go to the other side of the world. They understand what tribulation is. They understand what it is to be killed for their faith. There's more people, I mean, out, out, out of all of the regions in the world, Christianity, of all the religions in the world, Christianity is the greatest persecutor. You don't even hear about it on the news. People are getting persecuted constantly for their faith. All right, I'm going to close with this one. First Peter, what did I say? Chapter 4, verse 13. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good. I said four. I was reading three. I'm sorry. All right. Verse chapter four. All right. The title is Suffering as a Christian. Look at verse 12. Behold, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as though something strange was happening to you. Don't, don't be surprised. I mean, like, think about it. If they hated Jesus and they killed him, what are they going to do to you? If you hold to the same values that Jesus holds to, what are they going to do to you? Verse 13, but rejoice insofar as that you share Christ's sufferings, 
that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Apocalypse. The word there again. Apocalypse. Okay? Now, there's a third word, epiphania, which means manifestation, and I'll come back to that next week. Questions? Yeah. So, on the mystery thing, um, if the church is going to see the two witnesses and um, the angels that fly in the air, and if it is at that point, you're going to witness all of that. Uh, in the if you're if you're mid if you're mid trip. Depending upon which view that you hold to, right? So if you're pre-trib, you're going to be gone. You won't be here. If you're mid-trib, you're going to see some of it. If you're post-trib or pre-wrath, you're going to see a lot of it. Okay, so but, but we don't know where the two witnesses fall into Oh, I'll get into that in Revelation. Where, where it turns out falls, yeah. I'll get into that. Um, yes? Should we all, I know... Pre-trib, whatever trip, <laughs> he's coming back, so we should be ready. Exactly. Right? So we don't need to get caught up in that, really. Do we? Yeah. And further, in, and further along in that we, we we certainly don't need to fight about it. That's, that's for right. sure. That's right. Because if you look at what, grab your sheet of paper with Matthew chapter twenty-four on. Because here's what he's going to do in chapter twenty-four and chapter twenty-five. After he spells everything out. What does he say? Beginning in verse 36. No one knows the hour or the day, right? He's going to be telling us to work for him. Verse 45. Faithful wise servant to his master set over his household, right? They didn't know when the master was coming back. What were they doing? They were to be working. What were the people, what were the wise virgins supposed to be doing? Chapter 25. They were supposed to be eagerly waiting and working till the Lord's return. And the problem in the Thessalonian church was is they weren't working. They had stopped working because they believed the Lord was going to come back. So they said, the Lord's coming back. Why go to work tomorrow? Live off of credit cards. He's going to come. Some of us live off of credit cards anyway, right? Yeah. Well, that's one of our... Um, points in the, at the pre-trib nobody knows when he's going to come the, the, the tribulation is going to start when the, um, when the Antichrist doesn't sign every, all the pastors I keep hearing saying they say he's going to sign an agreement with, with Israel where they can build no he confirms a, an agreement uh -huh. well from that point we can count seven years and he's coming so if we were anywhere after the point where he confirms the covenant with the Jews to build their temple, if we were still here, we would know, hey, in seven years, he's coming, man. If, if that's what you believe, that's what it's, if that's what you believe, that's what it's teaching, that it's a confirming of a covenant out of Daniel, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm going to submit to you when we talk about Daniel is that's one way of interpreting it, and if you're pre-trib, that's how you interpret it. If you're post-trib, you look at it a little differently. So well, the most we'll, important thing is, is we know right. he is coming. He is coming, That's and we've got to be working to serve him. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, I need someone to come up here. Art, you want to come turn that thing off?